Hello and welcome to Futuroscope on the outskirts of Poitiers and to the 87th running of the Tour de France. Well, over these past few years especially, this event has delighted, occasionally disappointed, shocked and surprised us. And there's no reason to think now, as we go into the next 23 days of racing, things will change. The greatest annual sporting event is about to go on the roads of France. Yes, indeed, and we can expect more fireworks before Paris on July the 23rd. The race this year is over 3,600 kilometres, and after the time trial here in Futuroscope, we have the return of the team time trial on Tuesday. Next week, we are in the Pyrenees, and in the final week, we cross the difficult Alps en route for the traditional finish on the Champs-Élysées in Paris. Last Thursday, the stars appeared. A fit and indeed slim Jan Ulrich walked tall, affording perhaps private thoughts of a second tour win. The tiny climber Marco Pantani affording a smile after a fraught 12 months of little competition yet cannot be discounted. And a relaxed defending champion as American Lance Armstrong breezed into town ready for action. But he's well aware how important a good start is in the time trial opening. Um, the first day is an opportunity to take what I consider to be serious time because it's at 16 kilometers, you're looking at 18, 19 minutes. That's a chance on, on some climbers to take close to two minutes. So Lance is the last to start of the 180 riders, and we can now go to the action in this first day time trial. In the commentary box with me is Paul Sherwin. So the arrival of David Miller as he lines up for the finish here now. He's set the best time at midway through the course. Is he going to produce the surprise now for Great Britain? There it is, a one against the leader on the board. Miller is in with a chance here now. It's not going to be by very much. It's a long way up this home straight. Miller is challenging the long-time leader of the former world champion, Laurent Jalabert. His first Tour de France. Can he do what Chris Boardman did and go out with a win in the opening day? and claim a leader's yellow jersey. We're going to know very shortly now because a lot of riders have finished. Only a few to start as Miller comes up to the line. He's got the target. 19 minutes and 3 seconds. Now the rest have it all to do. Miller has set down the best time. Well, Paul, that was an outstanding ride by Miller and one we expected, I think. Well, I expected him to get high, Phil. Many, many people really felt that this man could finish in the top ten, but to put the fastest time in so far is really quite remarkable. Out on the course, though, Ulrich has now gone in at the first, second time check here with the same time as Jalabert and Miller as well. And this is on the climb of the Côte de Journée climb, which is a 3.7% one-kilometre climb, and there's nothing in it here between the top three. Now, the winner of one year ago, Lance Armstrong, makes his depart. He started winning in the first event last year well in fact you notice Armstrong is not wearing the yellow jersey as defending champion from last year because this stage today Phil has been classified as a stage not as a prologue it's 16 and a half kilometers long Armstrong is out on course and he's trying to go, to, go out there and rival the times of David Miller well, swinging around a bit now and we're back here to number 57 Abraham Alano as Jan Ulrich, the world time trial champion, there's a little bit of a nasty surprise. He's catched, uh, he's caught rather, Marco Pantani. Well, Pantani didn't start off very well in the in the prologue a couple of years ago today. And for him, it, the first week is trying to survive, trying not to lose too much time. The next man we're looking at here is Alex Zula. And you can see nowadays all of these bicycles resembling what the Union Cycliste Internationale regard as bicycles. You know, though, I have to say, Phil, Ulrich is looking very strong. He is looking very strong, and the likes of Zola is losing seconds, not just uh, to Ulrich, but also to David Miller, who is still the leader back at the finish. Now, one man I thought might have challenged Miller is Christophe Moreau, and he's not going to get even near, conceding more than a minute there, as he comes in 24th at the moment. Now look at this, at the 8-kilometre check, Miller best through there as well, and he's still looking good, Armstrong running him close. Well, three seconds at the moment, David Miller is the fastest time at the 8-kilometre time 
Kovacic out on the course. Six seconds ahead of Jalabert. Ulrich now, Phil, closing in on the line. Jan Ulrich is looking extremely good and has surprised many by how fit he really is looking now. Mr. Paul Pye, they used to call him just a couple of months ago. He's had a reasonable tour of Switzerland where he was the race leader, but he seemed to me to let that race run away from him. But now he's home and Ulrich is in and a good ride. 19.17 is time. The arrival of Pantani will be considerably slower. An awful long way down, but that's not what is important for Marco Pantani. It's the rest of this Tour de France. Abraham Alano is the next man to come to the line, and he too, Phil, has faded over the last few kilometres. Another former world time trial champion will not be happy with his opening stage of the Tour de France. The 16 and a half kilometres, and that is at 19.42 for him. Well, he really has faded over that apart, but this man is at the moment rivaling the time of David Miller. Miller is already in with the best time so far. Another man on the start line this year, Mikke Bartoli. Good ride by him, Sir Phil, inside the top 15. New champion of Italy, by the way, just won his title uh, just on a week ago. As we're now looking at the legs here of Lance Armstrong, and he is running very, very close to Miller's time now. And realistically, Paul, this man is the only rider now who can stop Miller winning because here's the arrival of Alex Zula. And for a man who has won the prologue time trial in the past, which this is a little bit further, of course, it's not a great ride for Zula, but he comes in fourth just now. Losing 20 seconds on David Miller's time, but this is the last man who can beat him. Lance Armstrong has posted great times out on the course field coming up to the line. That is the time to beat. And in fact, at the 13 kilometer time check, they're saying Armstrong was ahead. This has come to a sprint to the line here, and Lance Armstrong could well be doing the ride of his life to win the first stage and take the race leader's yellow jersey. It is all on this finish here as he comes up the straight in Futuroscope, but it's going to be desperately close now. There's the leading time of Miller. It survived all day as Armstrong, one second down and a few kilometres to go. Is he going to build on that or is he going to slow down? And he isn't going to do it, Paul. David Miller has won and Lance Armstrong will finish second. Well, that is amazing. Over the last few kilometres, Armstrong slowed and it would allow David Miller, the early starter, to take out the victory by a mere two seconds over the defending champion. Well, the big pumping legs of the defending tour champion Lance Armstrong, his form definitely coming good at the Dauphiné as he now looks forward to three weeks on the road in the Tour de France, but he must be a little bit surprised by the ride of the British rider from Cofidis, David Miller, one of the youngest riders in the race and uh, coming to the first Tour de France and he gets the victory over Lance Armstrong. Still, there's no doubt that Armstrong has laid down the gauntlet here for others to see. Look at this now. It's a good start for your defence. Just two seconds off the win. Jalabert taking third place. But in his first Tour de France, David Miller has done what Chris Boardman has done in the past and pull on the leaders at Yellow Jersey. So this was a superb ride by David Miller, the first leader of the Tour de France. A powerhouse all of the way as he thumped around quite a difficult course here at the theme park of Futuroscope uh, on the outskirts of Poitiers. And now it's off and a round of applause from the race director Jean-Marie Leblanc, 12.10 in the morning, Futuroscope to Loudan now, 194 kilometres and David Miller in the yellow jersey. How does he feel? Well, he must feel absolutely fantastic, but such a slim margin, Phil, just two seconds and out on the course. There are time bonuses, and as you can see, an excellent day today. A 20-kilometre win from the southwest and 24 degrees Celsius. These guys will enjoy their racing today. And three riders not allowed to start the Tour de France, by the way, yesterday. Sergei Ivanov, the champion of Russia, and Houtman, and also Rosana Brassi with the two high hematocrit levels. Breakaway here, this is Eric Decker, and who else but Jackie Duron, the Lantern Rouge of the Tour de France last year. They are out on the attack. Well, out on the attack, Jackie Duron, not only was he last last year in the Tour de France, he was voted the most aggressive bike rider of the Tour de France. And he deserved the title too, but Eric Decker, having ridden the Tour of Italy, also there in that breakaway. And we said only to Jackie Giron during the medical test that he really, uh, we wished him well on his lone escapes. Here is the sprint at Chateau Row at 138 and a half kilometers now. The field uh, more or less racing for third place because of a couple of minutes behind. And David Miller, the cheek of it, is going to take himself a two second time bonus. Now that's a little bit of a turn up for the books. A two-minute gap because Decker's already gone through with Jackie Durand as they continue on the way. There's the result of the sprint.
Well, one big man missing from the race this year is the sprinter Big Mario himself. Let's go now to Gary Imlach, who'll update us on that. Chippo's absence will be significant less for the lack of costume changes and dodgy publicity stunts we're going to see as for the effect it'll have on his perennial rivals in the first week sprints. Robbie, no Cipollini this year. No, sad, eh? Robbie McEwen said it, everyone else just thought it. Beating your rivals is one thing. Doing it dressed as Caesar could be construed as taking the post-race urine sample. Anyway, McEwen, who won last year's final sprint on the Champs-Élysées, is just one of a bunch who'll be jockeying to take Mario's place on the podium during the flat opening stages. The Estonian sprinter Jan Kersipu won the first stage last year and held on to the yellow jersey for a week. Belgium's Tom Steeles won the next two, then got disqualified to hand Cipollini the first of his record-breaking four in a row. He has to be considered the leading contender. Your own Blyleben's of Holland was averaging a stage a year before missing the race last year. And the senior member of the bunch is Germany's Eric Zabel with seven career wins, although the last was in 97. But although they may be happy to see Mario go, there are mixed feelings about the loss of the big red Saeco train that used to deliver him to the finish and keep the race under control in the process. It's going to make a di big difference, I know, because uh, it was the only team with, with a lot of experience and all the riders, uh, yeah, they were used to it now. And now uh, it's going to be difficult to control the, the bench for the, for the last uh, kilometers now. I think uh, this year we have uh, a more open situation in the race, so it's it's hard, uh, especially for my team, to control the, the bunch. Of course, less control means more danger in a race that already has the most dangerous sprints in the world. It's going to be some, some difficult sprints, I think. In the Tour, they're always a little bit over the edge, I think. But now, uh, if there's only one team that can that is trying to control the, the last 10 kilometers. It isn't much, so uh, let's hope that, uh, that we can uh, survive it. Well, whoever wins today, it's unlikely they'll be using the opportunity to dress up as a Roman emperor at tomorrow's stage start. Although Chippo's latest uniform violation actually consists of getting his kit off altogether in an advert for a shoe manufacturer. Anyway, the key thing for Cofidis and David Miller is that it's a nice bunch sprint today with a bit of glory for the fast men and no change in the overall classification. Well, I'll tell you what, Gary, that's exactly how it's going to work out now because it looks, Paul, as we yes. run down to the finish here at Loudin, that the telecom team again are trying to bring their man to the front, Eric Zabel. 1,000 metres, at the last kilometre for these riders now, but you can see the organisation is not here with the absence of Mario Cipollini. The pink and white jerseys on the front half was Eric Zabel, but on the right-hand side, the Mappé riders are also trying to line it up. There is Paolo Bettini taking the line around the corner first, looking over his shoulder. Robbie McEwen is right in there as well, and so is Stuart O'Grady. Well, the first stage for the sprinters of the Tour, they've averaged 40 and a half kilometres an hour today to keep this race together now. But uh, Paolo Lanfranchi it is who swings off the front, and the telecom boys are now looking around for Zabel. Uh, Tom Steele's in there, but not looking too content at all as they now uh, move up towards the line here now. And it is Jean Matteo Fanini who again is looking to lead out Zabel. This is the man who was brought over from the Cipollini Seiko team this year. And Zabel is now in a perfect position here as they run towards the line. But Tom Steele has pushed his way out of the pack there. Roman Vane stays on his wheel as Fanini launches Zabel for the line. This is going to be a very tight sprint because we've also got Stuart O'Grady in there as well as he comes on the left of our picture but I think on the line Steels has stolen it from O'Grady and Eric Zabel but that was a royal sprint with all of them desperate for the first big win of the tour very nervous sprint as well Phil we saw a lot of arms and legs coming out of uh, the uh, the way there as everybody tried to go forward Marcel was caught in the middle there as well almost losing it this is the lead out here you see there almost losing it Tom Steele's comes right around Fanini loses a lot of impetus Veinstein's moving up around the outside as well but once he gets the acceleration going it's all the way to the line for Tom Steele's there in the middle was Wust in the King of the Mountains jersey a lead that he took in the opening time trial and Stuart O'Grady on the inside by the Barriersville throws it at the line but just a little bit too late.
Well, O'Grady will be quite pleased because he's aiming for the green jersey that Eric Zobel has won for these past four years, and that's a good start for the Australian getting second. Uh, Tom Steele said before the start of the tour he'd be content with one stage win, so now I guess he can be content. Marcel Wust, by the way, wearing the King of the Mountains jersey there. He finishes fifth here because he was the best time in the time trial up the small climb. He went out in the time trial just to be the best time there and then eased back as he raced towards the finish. But he's got himself a jersey to wear. There is the confirmation of that result. Well, that was a great result, but you know, because the time trial was so long, Phil, there's been no real change in the overall standings. O'Grady and Zabel very happily up there in second and third place, but the next sprints are announcing that they're going to be fairly aggressive. The overall standings, you can see Lance Armstrong losing a couple of seconds there, four seconds behind David Miller, Lauren Jalabert 15 seconds back, but for David Miller, it's another day in the yellow jersey, out on the road, a title he hopes to keep hold of, Phil, until we get to the team time trial in a couple of days' time. Welcome to stage three now of the Tour de France. The ride is heading for Nantes and into Western France. Well, yesterday, David Miller found the true value of having a strong team about him. He'll expect the same again today. One thing's for sure, he's not overwhelmed by wearing the leader's yellow jersey, as he told yeah, okay. Gary Imlach. Everybody in the bunch is coming up and saying, well done. And it gives like having a VIP pass when you're in the bunch. You just go wherever you want and do whatever you want. Everyone lets you through. And life's a lot easier, basically. Plus, i got a whole team riding in front, so I don't have to do much. And at least one more day of it before the team time trial. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, no problems. Well, that's certainly very confident, Phil, no problems, because there are always problems out on the roads of the Tour de France. The yellow jersey of Miller alongside the King of the Mountains jersey of Wuss, the green jersey on the shoulders of Tom Steeles, the white jersey at the moment, well, that is a jersey that is being worn by the best young rider in the Tour de France, and it's the first time it's actually been reintroduced after an absence of many years. That, for the moment, is being worn by David Cañada. And there's the weather today, very low wind speed, 15 kilometres an hour coming in from the southwest. We are racing actually in a westerly direction today, so it's going to help them a little bit, I think. Glorious day here as we race now towards Nantes and the coast. And the riders, there's Tom Steeles already in green, the jersey, of course, which Eric Zorbel wants, and Zorbel has plenty of time yet. Well, there's going to be a big competition for the green jersey because Stuart O'Grady, the Australian, has already announced that that's the title he wants to take back to Sydney, that he wants to ride around the streets when he's going to defend and try and get himself an Olympic gold medal. Stewie is still the only Australian ever to have worn that jersey, which he had done briefly. Now, this is Jens Zavoit here in the green, the Freddy Agricola, and with him is Michael Blaudson of the memory car Jack and Jones team. They've been away, they got away at the 27th kilometre, but they are now all back together. It's been a long chase down, but you know, Paul, we're heading up here for possibly another sprint finish now. Well, they had a maximum advantage of over six minutes at one stage, but you know, it's a strange tour, the opening couple of days so far, because with the absence of Mario Cipollini from the race, none of the sprinters at the moment, Phil, really seem to want to control the race. We saw a lot of work done early on by David Miller's Cofidis team, but the big teams for tomorrow's team time trial, the Onse squad, the US Postal Service team, they've been completely absent, but coming into the streets of town, it is all together. It's a nasty approach into Nantes, there's one or two tricky little bends, the field is all together as they get under two kilometres to go there now and that's the sort of example of the traffic furniture put down in the French streets now it causes quite a few problems and this peloton is absolutely flying now it looks like Freddy Rodriguez on the front it's half a dozen riders gone down there Phil right in the middle of the road some of the sprinters have gone down there on the yellow on the yellow jersey is David Miller he too has been caught out by that accident well it was some sort of ricochet crash a touch of wheels in the middle and uh, down has gone along La Francaise de rider Miller is on the side of the road there now we're not inside the last kilometer Paul which means he is losing time he's got to get back well his teammate is right up there alongside him he's gonna have to get back very quickly this is Marcus Zerberg on the floor the new champion of Switzerland he doesn't look too good for the moment he looks as if he might have a problem with his collarbone but for David Miller the important thing is to try and get onto the back of the main field but that crash may well have caused a small split well this is a desperate chase now for Miller to get back on Jean-Patrick Nazon was the rider who seemed to cause the accident. His teammates are waiting for him, but Miller's not waiting for them. That is a very fine piece of riding because he is tacked on here. It's taken.
taken him about half a mile, that's all. At the front end now, the sprint is starting. Miller is on the back end of the bunch, but I do believe the bunch is slightly split. Stefan Vesterman here now, and on his wheel is Freddy Rodriguez, the new champion of the United States, uh, trying to mix in. Rodriguez now looking for Tom Steele. He's in the green jersey, but there's a couple of lead-out men lining up for Steele's now. And this could be a very good approach, because I think that's Fanini in second place. Tom Steele's in third. Zorbel's got a good wheel in fourth, and so too Stuart O'Grady is lined up once again a sprint royale here as the riders head up towards the line now and they're, they're trying to launch Tom Steeles here to the finishing line surely he is not going to make it too look at the face of Steeles as Steeles comes off the wheel of Fanini now Zabel has got him lined up on his shoulder as Marcel Vos comes on the right of our picture but no doubt about it Paul Tom Steeles has done it again he's got a big thank you there to say to Stefano Zanini I didn't think he was ever going to come past his Italian teammate there he was at full speed right on the wheel but he was holding back and waiting this is a very difficult sprint to judge you can see how long it is the important thing now though Phil looking back down this line is to see just where is David Miller and the yellow jersey there was a split at the front of that main field what we have to know now is was Lance Armstrong in the front there's Miller the yellow jersey of Miller coming in at the rear end of this bunch and it's going to be a long time for him to count and see if he's going to keep that yellow jersey because at the start of the day his advantage was a mere four seconds well, in fact, Paul, the first 25 riders have been given a nine-second advantage over the Miller group, uh, but that will not lose in the lead because, in fact, in that group was also Armstrong, so he will keep his race leader's yellow jersey. Ulrich was paying attention, though, because he was in the front split. Well, Ulrich being very attentive, and I have to say, I think Jan Ulrich is in excellent form there. The grey-haired gentleman talking to David Miller is his team manager, Alain Bondu, a former two-time champion of the world, and here is confirmation of that stage result. Phil Steele's ahead of Wust and Zabel. The big sprinters are all there. Jans Quartz in fourth place, Stuart O'Grady in fifth. And there's the confirmation of the overall. Armstrong now at second of four seconds as Jalabur six. Ulrich closes in to fourth place now, seven seconds back. And the race now making ready for the team time trial today as we leave Nantes, heading for Saint-Nazaire. It's a 70-kilometre team time trial reintroduced into the race. But before they get to the start, David Miller can smile. The French are saying, well, he is a little bit dandy, which is a fine English phrase. And he says, yes, I am, and enjoying it. But how this crash almost robbed him of the yellow jersey and what great courage he's shown and sense of positioning as well to get back on his bike and save the day he's now achieved his ambition Paul he started the team time trial in yellow but the Cofferdies team here have done a ride the best team in his credit agricole Cofferdies are going to come in a best third well this has been a very difficult race you know 70 kilometers a lot of the teams have been built specifically for this team time trial which has been reintroduced this year Miller has looked strong throughout although his team have lost one or two riders over the last climb of the day the Pont de saint Nazar. Miller's going to lead them over in the yellow jersey they will lose some time but Phil the best teams are still to come they are there are still four teams to come Telecom Festina Onse and US Postal who are leading the team so they get to start last David Miller has done his best there with what we think is a reasonably good ride but it won't be good enough I don't think uh, to give him the leader's yellow jersey for another day this is the next team in Zabel's team and they're racing for different reasons right now they're racing now to put Jan Ulrich right up on the leaderboard well basically the way the race is at the moment Phil any one of these teams that gets first man across the line is going to look at getting the new yellow jersey in their squad Deutsches Telekom are going to push Credit Agricole out of the first position what a great ride Vinukarov is up there in first position Jan Ulrich is safely in this group at the moment and Deutsche Telekom Phil are going to come in here with the fastest time the new best time on the day well, the faces on these guys says it all because the ride over the bridge, and we'll see it shortly, is so difficult. It's causing a lot of teams to fragment up there. There's Ulrich on the left of our picture, and they're set fair here for the best time. They're just going to creep inside Credit Agricole. 127.01. Let's go out to the bridge now and look at US Postal. And Lance Armstrong is having to slow down to regroup the team. Well, they're having a hard time keeping all together. This is Frankie Andreu riding the Tour de France for the ninth time, Phil, in succession the greatest thing an American has ever done at the Tour de France and Frankie has ridden and finished every one of his tours so far Armstrong now is having to slow down for the rest of the team here because the time counts on the fifth man across the line he cannot ride away on his own to prove how powerful he is he's got to wait for the team 
Well, at all of the time checks so far, Anse, who are in front here of US Postal and heading for the finish, are setting the best markers. And US Postal have been a three seconds behind at the first check and a 13 seconds behind at the next. They're just slipping away slightly. That's the latest now. Anse are still the best. Deutsche Telekom in second. But Anse, Phil, here we are looking at them now. I've got all riders together. There's still nine men. Look at this speed, over 50 kilometers an hour at the moment. The white jersey in that group was Kanyada. This now is the US Postal Service team. They are down to six riders. And look at Tyler Hamilton wearing number four at the back of the group here. He's all over his machine. He's trying to stay in contact. This is the man who earlier this year won the Dauphiné Libéré. And they are losing time, 38 seconds behind Anse, but they are ahead of Team Deutsche Telekom. Well, Anse are now heading into the finish, and here they come. David Kanyada is the rider in the white young jersey at the moment. That's another reintroduction into the tour this year. Now, this is going to be the best time because it's been indicated throughout the course. Now, it'll set the marker for US Postal to follow. The clock stops on the fifth man, 125.35. That is the time, and a whisker under 50 kilometres an hour. All nine men, that was the important thing. They saved themselves over the final few kilometres to keep the nine men there and in the last 10 kilometres that is what counts to have a full team working together the face of Laurent Jalabert there in the middle tells it all as does that of Abraham Alano coming across the line right now this is the time of reference for the US Postal Service but there's no organisation at all in this team now Phil they are all over the place this team was looking extremely fluid till they started the climb of the Pont de Saint-Nazaire and since then they've been a little bit ragged they know they've got to finish five men one or two of their riders have been openly uh, struggling including Tyler Hamilton now they are racing to finish second team here and they may not concede too much to the Onse the Onse of course carrying two possible candidates there for victory in Laurent Jalabert and Abraham Alano but they would like to score over the telecom team at least now here they come as they're being led up to the finishing line by big George Hincapie and racing Ekimov in second wheel here remember they're trying to bring home the defending tour champion to keep him high in the overall classification well as we said they're not going to match the Onse Deutsche Bank but they have got second, conceding 46 seconds. George takes off his helmet. Well, I think they'll be reasonably happy with that. They knew they had to beat Torture Telecom. They may well not be too worried about Abraham Alano and Laurent Jalabert, but for this team, they were in serious difficulty, Phil, over that Pont de Saint-Nazaire. But this out on the course was a serious incident. The Onse team were actually waiting for their man to get onto the back of the group here, and this is Marcos Serrano wearing number 59, a man who could play feature highly when we get to the mountain. The team car here has come alongside. Now bear in mind the wind is coming from the left-hand side. The race referees have decided to give every man in the team a 20-second time penalty. Well, I'm afraid that was a shrewd move, but he might have saved more than 20 seconds because he was able to get him back in the group. And this happened to the Onse team about three kilometres after the start. There was a number of workers here protesting about the closure of a local disco and made a deliberate attempt to stop the team. They didn't even hesitate, although they're saying they lost maybe 10 seconds. But they still won the day, finishing 26 ahead of US Postal in the end, a minute six over Telecom and Ulrich, and 112 over Credit Agricole with Bobby Julik and Jonathan Waters in that. The yellow jersey changes shoulders and now it is a Frenchman in the leader's yellow jersey and Laurent Jalabert is back once and for all. Kanyada is in second place, Armstrong has dropped to third, Abraham Olano is now in fourth. Marcus Serrano did well to hang on because now he is up into eighth place overall, Paul. Well, the team time trial certainly has formed the top of the overall standings for the next few days and I don't expect that, Phil, is going to change very much on the stage from Van to Vitre, a fairly flat course. A fairly flat course indeed as we're heading out as we continue now a right uh, inland again from Van. We just moved up the coast from Saint Nazaire for a lovely start here at 12.40 in the afternoon in France. And the days have not been really hot and sunny, but they have been quite pleasant at the moment. And the new man on the block, Laurent Jalabert, didn't ride the Tour de France last year. And just that scant 12 seconds. And not surprisingly either, all of the Telecom boys are claiming a lot of the overall classifications now. Well, the strange thing is, Phil, in the morning press, they had said they weren't going to defend the overall lead, but we have seen a lot of Onse on the front of this main field. Well, the weather has changed, the rain has come down, it's still fairly warm at 23 degrees Celsius, and still the wind, a slight problem, 20 kilometres an hour from the southwest. Well, I shouldn't have mentioned the weather, Paul, as usual, of course, it does what the commentator says it won't do. We've had a little bit of a shower now, the quite heavy storms when they pass through. As we come to the sprint now at Mohan, 
152 kilometers covered and Jens Voigt on the attack again here with Sebastian de Marbay and uh, in fact these two riders Paul have got away again and Voigt lining himself up for the most aggressive rider the main field is only just behind some fifth uh, sorry yes 15 seconds back at the moment well there's David Miller he started uh, this tour off in the yellow jersey he's now down in 24th place overall and Marcel Wustville is the king of the mountains which really is quite humorous for him because he really has a hard time going over even the slightest mountain on this course well Marcel's last tour de France by the way was in 1992 so at least he's back here as we continue on now to the Eriac sprint and again a little breakaway here with Kuz Moon out going through but what about the man who is in the overall lead? He's still sat back in that main field, doesn't seem too keen on the, um, trying to stop these attacks today as we course through these beautiful villages on the Ile et Vilaine in France. As we race across the Côte d'Amour and onto the Ile et Vilaine, let's go to Gary Imlac now, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the return of Lange Jalabert to the Tour de France. So the French have their first yellow jersey for two years and joy should be unconfined throughout toute la belle France. Things are never that straightforward on the tour though and this yellow jersey belongs to a Frenchman who lives in Switzerland, rides for a Spanish team and has a very complicated relationship with his home race. Laurent Jalabert started life in the tour as a sprinter and almost finished it the same way. Nelson goes on the left, the rest are following, Martinelli is here too for the Palti team as they come up towards the line, Nelson is taking, oh and they've gone, they've gone, one after the other, they've hit the barriers, Nelson was not looking where he was going. That crash in 1994, the fault of a policeman who stepped out into the road to take a photo, put Jalabert out of action for months. When he'd recovered he was a different rider, the top speed was lower but the fuel economy was up, he'd become an all-rounder. On his return to the Tour the following year, he took the yellow jersey on stage two. But although he'd changed, his luck apparently hadn't. They realise that Mario Cipollini has got a chance to win this stage and it looks today as if it will go. And there's somebody oh, gone down this. in the corner. Oh my goodness me, that was the roundabout we were warned about and they've gone straight on into the barriers. And I have a feeling, Phil, there it may well be the yellow jersey went down there. Laurent Jalabert was the yellow jersey on the right-hand side. He's outside the one kilometre side, so it may well be he's going he to lose it today. That crash, no police officers implicated, lost him the yellow jersey. But that year he wore the green of the points competition winner, won a stage in Monde on Bastille Day and finished fourth overall, his best ever tour. Chalabert went on to be national champion, world number one, and along with Richard Vironque, one of the twin heroes of French cycling. Vironque, flash and flamboyant, Chalabert stoic, almost Jurassic, a rider out of the old mould which made the events of 1998 all the more traumatic for him and his fans. Unlike Vironk, Jalabert was never implicated in the drug scandal that engulfed the 98 tour. But he was a spokesman for the riders who felt harassed by the police tactics, and eventually he left the race in disgust along with his Onsay teammates. Afterwards, he fell out badly with the French cycling establishment, snubbing the national championships last year and boycotting the tour. Tempers have cooled since then, this year Jalabert's back and he's taken the second yellow jersey of his career. This one though is perhaps less as an individual French rider than as the leader of a foreign team. C'est presque plus important que quand on, on gagne tout seul, je crois que c'est un, un collectif qui gagne et ça va donner le moral à tout le monde et, et je pense que c'est parti pour, pour nous, pour, pour que ce soit un grand jeu. Well, there he is, and he's riding his ninth Tour de France, Laurent Jalabert now, and looking pretty cool in the race leader's jersey. He could take this all the way down to the Pyrenees, you know. The gap is a minute and 32 seconds for the breakaway, really having got away today with that attack by Jens Voigt and de Marbet after about 51 kilometres. But they're just hanging on here now, and the bunch, they don't look round because they're almost up behind them. This is unbelievable. Decker's the man in first position there. Jens Voigt is the man in second position, and the sprint is led up the front there by the pink and white jerseys of the telecom team of Eric Zabel. These guys, Phil, have been trying to hold on to the slenderest of advantages and it's coming down, it's going to go down to the last few hundred metres. The two survivors of a five-man breakaway and the finish is in sight. The unfortunate thing is it's a long straight road and as you can see it is also slightly uphill and again it is Fred Rodriguez, the US champion, who's doing so much hard work and I think this time they've got them.
Well, Voigt looks over his shoulder there. Freddy Rodriguez out of the saddle now. This man has really become a top professional this year, Phil. He digs deep for him, the sprinter to the back wheel of Eric Decker, and then he will swing off and lead it all up to Team Telecom. In second position is Gian Matteo Fanini on his wheel. Is Zabel right in there is the green jersey of Steels. Well, as they come up towards the line now, it's going to be a very tight sprint indeed, this one, but again, Fanini is giving Zabel a perfect lead out. Steels is running behind, and Steels also got his lead out, man, but on on the left of the picture, Zabla and Wust has gone across there now. Marcel Wust, who's never won a stage of the Tour, I think he's about to change it because he's got the measure of Zabal. So he's had a third, a second, and now he's got his first ever stage victory. Absolutely unbelievable. What a dangerous sprint, though. Fanini, Fanini moving across the road there, just sitting up as soon as he'd launched Eric Zabal into his attack. But this man winning the leader's jersey of the King of the Mountains competition, Phil, he's going to have a real laugh about that. Well, he's had some regular appearances on the post. You may be told to get a new King of the Mountains jersey every day because we've had no mountains to contest since the prologue time trial. But look at the way he realised that Zabel had got the jump over Tom Steeles on this occasion, dived across to the right, picked up the German's wheel, and this is a German 1-2, and the history books show that a very, very few German 1-2s ever recorded in the stage finish of the Tour de France. It's unfortunate Zabel would have liked it to have been the other way around, and in fact, Stefano Zanini, the lead-out man for Steeles, <laughs> finished in front of him and got the third place can you believe that well, looking at the face of Steels there he wasn't happy with his sprint today the confirmation of Wurstvin ahead of Zabel Zanini third and Tom Steels fourth but what a great job done there by Freddy Rodriguez the US champion and a bunch sprint and this is how you do it when you want to win a sprint but there's a little confusion as to which domestic was leading out whom on this occasion but even so uh, they found the right winner in the end because Marcel was absolutely delighted with that sprint victory the first ever in a Tour de France but the long breakaway today Jens Voigt was part of it and he really was the hero of the day I think and so does Paul Jens that was that was so close yeah today I was really disappointed because uh, it looked really like just until the very last end it looked really really good for us and I really thought we could make it and but finally to just get us like it happens almost uh, that's a shame because Jens Voigt is really a very aggressive rider in this year's tour this man cannot believe this opening few days of the Tour de France he's never come off the podium Marcel Wust getting the winner's prize but Laurent Jalabert keeping the Maillot Jaune no change overall at all with the big field coming down that home straight all together there so Jalabert ahead of Cañada and Lance Armstrong looking extremely good in third place there's the kisses from the young ladies in yellow and uh, Laurent Jalabert salutes the crowd here. He is still a very popular figure here, especially in this part of France, which is a cycling hotbed. On to stage six now, 198 kilometres, saying goodbye to Vitre. I'm on to the famous cycling city of Tours. And sadly, with 80 kilometres to go, Paul, yeah, this crash crazy. involving Stuart O'Grady. Well, that's bad news for the Australian. He's looking like a serious candidate for the green jersey, which has been Eric Zabel's for the last four years. But the way he was holding his shoulder there, Phil, I do happen to think that he has got a problem with his collarbone. Yes, it doesn't look good at all, in fact, and the Lantern Rouge so far is also in trouble. Mateos, he doesn't look too good either, but the riders slowly are getting themselves underway, and Stuart O'Grady looking with the best part of 85 kilometres still to ride to the finish, and that might be a tough call, judging by the way he's looking. Anyway, he's underway, and as he's on his way, we can now go back again to Gary Imlach, who is now going to tell us a little other fable that he finds out about the Tour de France, and he really does dig deep for them so let's join Gary now in American television terms cycling has a profile somewhere between temp in bowling and competitive aerobics but the Americans do love a good human interest story so the fact that Lance Armstrong came back from cancer to win the tour has made him a huge star and to his credit he's capitalized on that to raise awareness and money for the fight against the disease the first toast and I would like uh, all cancer survivors in the room to stand up Lance Armstrong was on his hind legs for most of the off-season, spreading the word and swelling the coffers of cancer charities, cashing in on a public profile even Greg LeMond in his heyday never had. Because he's an inspiration to people everywhere, we chose Tour de France winner Lance Armstrong as the most fascinating person of 1999. Ladies and gentlemen, 
Please welcome 1999's SB Comeback Athlete of the Year, Tour de France champion Lance Armstrong. It was, uh, it was major for cycling, but it was also major for cancer. And I think that uh, the combination of the two uh, made it a story. I think had I just won the Tour de France and ne never had an illness like cancer, uh, perhaps it wouldn't have been told as, uh, as much, but... The Lance Armstrong comeback tour started with a parade through his hometown of Austin, Texas, continued with a ceremonial appearance for the local college football team, and finished up where all celebrity stories do, on the talk shows. What has your life been like since then? Just nuts, I guess, Just huh? nuts. Yeah. Just basically nuts. And just to keep life from returning to normal, a second-generation Armstrong celebrity arrived in the shape of Luke David, conceived by in vitro fertilization from sperm that had been stored before Lance's chemotherapy. It was hectic. I mean, there were times where I really wished that I had a whole month to stay at home and just be with my family. But uh, at the same time, there, I have a responsibility to the cancer community and to the cycling community to, to tell the story. Not to mention the responsibility he has to himself and his family to cash in on the relatively short shelf life of an athlete's marketability, which he's been doing with ads for everything from breakfast cereal to pharmaceuticals. He even manages to get copy out of the whispering campaign conducted against him in last year's tour. Everybody wants to know what I'm on. What am I on? I'm on my bike, busted my ass six hours a day. What are you on? Now, as well as dealing with everything else, Lance, of course, is also trying to defend his title. And we'll hear from him again in a few days, talking about the race, his rivals, and especially the upcoming mountains. For the moment, though, let's go back to the race on the road. So as you look down from the helicopter now, we're looking down on the leaders of the Tour de France, and these 12 riders are still there. The reason being the bunch has turned off again and this breakaway now leading by about seven and a half minutes. They are set fair now to take out the stage and the overall leader of the Tour de France will be either Alberto Eli for Deutsche Telekom or Fabrice Gugo for the Credit Agricole because they are split overall by just 12 seconds. And that 12 seconds is on the finishing line, Phil, because it's 20 seconds for the first man to cross the line, but Alberto Eli is a very crafty bike rider. He knows all he has to do is keep an eye on the Credit Agricole rider, Fabrice Gugo, and if, in fact, he finishes just in front of him, there's no problem for this man, who is almost the oldest bike rider in the race. On the front, though, you can see the acceleration is coming from Mark Wouters, the Rabobank rider, keeping the pace high. I think they're trying to sort it out for Marcus Zerberg, the champion of Switzerland. Well, the one thing's for sure now, Paul, Laurent Jalabert meant what he said when he would not defend that leader's yellow jersey because the Anse team were called off the front of the bunch and this breakaway has virtually been away right from the start. Well, they went after 14 kilometres, but the big advantage here is for the Rabobank team. Phil, they've got three riders in this breakaway and I cannot believe a man from France in the yellow jersey has let a group go off the front. He has thrown away the lead in the bike race to the man at the moment in second position or the man in third. I'm not surprised at a big counter-attack coming here from Jose Luis Arieta and they're all now chasing him. This is one of the most famous finishing straights in the world of cycling. And Paul Sherwin himself has raced down here in the Paris Tours Classic. All of these riders know this sort of finish, including Mark Wouters, who is in this breakaway because he was the winner of the last edition of Paris Tour. And he's just tailed off the back of the group now as he watches his teammate come clear. So there he is, Leon Van Bon has won the stage and in the distance there you may have noticed is the hand going up of Mark Wouters because that was the plan and Leon Van Bonn has got the stage but the high finishing Alberto Eli will be the new leader of the Tour de France and really that was not expected. It certainly wasn't, but what a great career for this man. The main field, Phil, coming in 7 minutes and 49 seconds behind, and the yellow jersey of Laurent Jalabert has disappeared from the top of the leaderboard. But what a very sad day for Stuart O'Grady. He will be taken to hospital with a suspected broken collarbone. Well, and he's come in all the way to the finish on his bike with his arm draped over the handlebars, unable to pull on those bars. Go seven. And a brave man David indeed. Miller, there is the stage other. result. The on, Van Bonn the on top, top and gets a second stage victory for him in the Tour de France. He won the last time in Poe in 1998. The race goes on.
Hello again and welcome back to our coverage of the Tour de France. The ride is on stage 7 now, leaving Tours and heading to Limoges. 205 kilometres for them today and sadly without Stuart O'Grady. And when Gary Imlach caught up with Stewie last night in his hotel, he was understandably pretty despondent. Yeah, I, I knew as soon as I landed, like on my head and shoulder, that something wasn't right and I was pretty dazed at the time and uh, someone just kind of picked me up and put me back on my bike and you know, I knew straight away I couldn't, couldn't even put any pressure on it that something wasn't right and um, kind of grovelled to the finish and uh, yeah, it's broken collarbone you know, on the shoulder joint or something. So, What were those last ATK like? I just wanted to get off but I don't know and just kind of just tell myself like... Um, you know, just a few more K and I couldn't pull on the bars so every time we were coming to a little, even a speed hump I was just getting dropped and one of the other guys was just pushing me back on and just, I don't know, just thinking this will finish and, you know, yeah, everything will be okay. It's always a shame when a tough bike rider has to pull out of the tour but the x-rays Phil revealed that his collarbone was broken in three places and he's now been transported to Bordeaux for a special operation. And there's the weather, 20 kilometres per hour coming from the west today as the riders head due south, more or less away from Tours, down to Limoges, so they're going to have a crosswind, but it's not that strong. The telecom team are trying to get Zarbo points at the intermediate sprint competitions, and here's the first one now at Loche, and let's have a look if he's in the action. He certainly is in the action, he's just behind the motorbike here. He gets the six points for the jersey, Lolly Ose is second, and Marcel Vust uh, still challenging in that competition, he is third. So that's a good start for the telecom and for Zabel in particular. Well, Eric Zabel knows how to battle for this competition, Phil. He will go out for all of the intermediary sprints and try and be consistent, as he has been over the last four years. But the big attempt now to make him number one is this man's addition to the team, Gian Matteo Fanini, the former leader, lead-out man for Mario Cipollini, and he certainly is a super asset for the team. Well, he led out Eric Zabel indeed to the win in Milan San Remo this year, and now we've moved on to Martin, Martin Zay at 75 kilometres. And Jackie Duran is causing a little bit of a ripple of concern here with Anja Luto and Vicente Garcia Acosta next in line. So no points for Zabel, and the man who has uh, ignored them all now and gone off on his own in the rain. This is Christophe Anja Luto former winner of the Tour of Switzerland and now heading off in rather a dreary set of circumstances up towards the third sprint here at Rusak and his last time check Paul was six and three quarter minutes ahead of the main field so they've really allowed him his head well you know what he may well just get France their first victory in the Tour de France since 1998 but still Eric Zabel is willing to go out and fight for more points on the road he wants to try and get himself that green jersey and he comes across the line nicely Beating Marcel Wuss there, who's now out of the lead in the King of the Mountains competition. So there's the result of that. The bunch timed through at precisely 6 minutes 40 seconds. So Zabel is the man of the day again. He's picked up uh, 10 points towards the Green Jersey competition, but he's still not done what he dreams of doing every tour. He hasn't won a stage, in fact, since 1997. The bunch all together, with the exception of this one rider, Christoph Agnoluto, who got away at the 77-kilometre point, and his lead has gone up now to in excess of eight minutes, and the peloton do not seem concerned with chasing him. Overall, he's 82nd, 11 minutes behind. Let's hear more about Zabel. Last year, the green jersey competition was a straight fight between Stuart O'Grady and Eric Zabel, with the German eventually coming out on top to take an unprecedented fourth straight points title. Well, of course, Stuart O'Grady has already gone this year, sadly, and although Zabel will take no pleasure from that, it certainly increases his chances of doing what no man has ever done, either consecutively or otherwise, and that's win five green jerseys. The Zabel family don't bother with pencil marks on the kitchen wall. They just put young Rick on the podium in Paris every year and let the world's photographers check how much he's grown. His dad, on the other hand, appears to have been on a sort of brilliant plateau the last few years as the Tour's most consistent rider. But really, that's not the whole picture. When Eric Zabel won his first two green jerseys in 96 and 97, he was out sprinting the likes of Mario Cipollini for stage wins. In the last two, he's been shut out of the sprints, but still had enough overall strength and speed to rack up the points long after Chippo's packed his hair gel and gone home. Maintaining that kind of effort for a fifth straight year is going to be hard. Yeah, maybe too hard. 
That assessment is a combination of genuine modesty and the knowledge that the green jersey isn't his team's top priority. We have uh, also with uh, Jan Ulrich uh, the men who have the possibility to win the tour in overall. So, Eric may not have the whole team riding for him, but he does have some very specialised help. Last year he was second in no fewer than four sprint finishes, usually to Cipollini. This year, Telecom signed Chippo's lead-out man, Gian Matteo Fagnini. I think he's uh, the best man in this position uh, in the cycling world, and so we wait for the chance. The chance looked like it had come a couple of days ago in the sprint at Vitre. Fagnini doing his usual kamikaze job of setting up his man and sitting up with 200 metres to go and getting in everyone else's way. Unfortunately for Eric, his fellow German Marcel Wurst was the one to profit, taking his wheel, then him in quick succession. For most of the season, though, the partnership has been working perfectly. Sabal stormed through the classics, winning the likes of Milan, San Remo and the Amstel Gold Race. As he goes for a fifth green jersey, the question is, how long can he stay that strong? I don't know. Uh, I hope that uh, the legs are still good enough to, to win, but uh, it's also uh, possible that uh, I'm going too tired, and that's the tour, so we see. Well, we'll almost certainly see Eric Zabel in contention for the stage win today because it's his 30th birthday. He'll already have told Gian Matteo Fagnini what he wants and I don't think it'll be a record token. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. Thanks, Gary. As we're now going back to the lone leader of the race, he's under the 10 kilometres to go banner here. His gap has come down, Paul, and he's being chased at the moment by Michael Sandstod, but he's still enormous. He's struggling now, Christophe Agnoluto. But, you know, he's being drawn by the fact the Frenchman hasn't won a stage of the Tour de France for two years. And the last man to do that was Jackie Durand. There's confirmation of the gap. Michael Sandstod at 2 minutes 49 and the main field at 3 and a half. I can't really understand that manoeuvre by Sandstod. He's been caught in no man's land and he's actually at the moment not actually approaching the lone leader as he now can see on the horizon the finishing line and he's still riding fairly well. Just over 70 kilometres an hour on this flat piece of road here. And this is Michael Sandstad, himself a very good rider against the watch from Denmark. But uh, as Paula said, I think it's more the case of grabbing publicity rather than hoping. He got away with 35 kilometres to go when the gap up to the leader was 7.25. He is pulling him back, but he's pulling him back nothing like quick enough. Well, when your gap is that big, what you really have to do is go across a gap like that in a small group of riders. At the front of the main field is controlled by US Postal Service, but victory today is going to go to France. And he's going to enjoy this every minute of it because they've always said the first Frenchman to win a stage in this year's Tour is going to be remembered a big time. This is the third Tour de France for Christophe Agnoluto. He was 94th in 97, 31st in 98, but he's never before has featured as a stage winner. He's putting that to rights now and he's going to go down as the first man to win a stage since 1998 and he keeps looking over his shoulder he knows the field are closing the last check we got it was one minute and 30 seconds and that should be clearly enough plenty of time to enjoy it absolutely even Jean-Marie Leblanc the director of the Society Tour de France in the car behind was out of this out of the car as well happy to know that the French have broken their duck at last because last year not one solitary stage victory well, there's the clock on the right as the riders come over the top of the climb here. Uh, I think that's Anthony Moran who swings off as Coppedis look over the shoulder. Very strange bunch of sprinters here, but now Robbie McCune's trying to break in on the action on the far left as all of it starts again now. And Marcel Wuster's hit the front on the left of our picture as well. And Zabel too has come, so it's Wust Zabel, and it was, was the order over the line. Wust Zabel and Roman Veinstein's uh, two, three and four, but about a minute and 11 seconds down. Well, that was a great sprint there by Marcel Wurst, but a great day for the French as well, Phil. Marcel Wurst, what an incredible character he is. He races all over the world, and he really is a man who has got a, a special talent for languages. So there's the winner, Christophe Agnoluto, a minute and 11 over the rest of the race today. Just a couple of riders off the back, and he is all smiles. I'm not surprised. Celebrations tonight. This man is always on the podium. He gets a green jersey now as leader of that by three points. And uh, as he, when Susie gets down off the podium, Paul Sherwin will be with him. It's a bit of a ding-dong battle between you and Zabel, though, because uh, the lead actually changed, uh, changed sides a couple of times today. 
Yeah, it's true. Uh, Eric was really flat out competing the sprints. Uh, in the first one, I just, you know, I just followed him, and then in the second one, I tried to come around, but I couldn't. But uh, basically, today I had uh, one of the worst days I had this so far this year. I'm, uh, I know I have a little throat infection. My nose is uh, sort of blocking up. And when the team was asking me, "How do you feel? Should we bring him back?" I said, "No." I just said, "I'm, I'm really stuffed. I'm, I'm really tired. My muscles ache everywhere." So, well, finally, I won the sprint, and now I'm second. So it's kind of a bummer, but uh, you know, the two or three weeks, so. You don't want to really stuff up the team in the first week. It's good that the boys had a rest. So because you weren't feeling so well, that's why the team didn't chase. But why didn't some of the other teams chase like Mape? Well, I've seen uh, Tom Steele today quite a, quite a few times, and uh, well, he was he was not feeling much better than I was. You know, we were going backwards, both of us in the hills, and uh, you know, the tour is like uh, it's like it's like the surf in Australia. It's uh, up up the waves and down the waves. And today I was really down, so it can only go up again. And then. And this green jersey, I think it helps a little bit. Well, what a great first week Marcel Vost is having. Alberto Elido is still in yellow, heading towards the Pyrenees. Fabrice Hugo in second place, 12 seconds down. Mark Rout is having a very, very good tour. He crashed out, remember, in the Passage du Bois last year when he broke his collarbone. So Ellie in yellow. Be careful how you say that as he now uh, heads off today from Limoges to Villeneuve sur Lot. Normally an area which is very hot and humid, but the weather is so strange this year, it's not that way at all. And David Miller in the field of 174, leaving Limoges this morning in overcast conditions, about five hours more in the saddle for them, on a fairly hilly ride down to Villeneuve, and one man beginning to sharpen his sprinting legs is Robbie McEwen. Here he is as we roll away. France on this side of the street. Uh, see, mostly I do these little interviews during the neutral because after they drop the flag, I normally can't speak anymore. But uh, one week gone, we've only had three bunch sprints, which is really not many. Uh, I guess there's a little bit of lack of sprinters, there's a couple missing, there's a couple sick. Tom Steele's is sick, Christopher has a problem with his back. Telecom don't really want to ride hard to keep everything together. So uh, I think today is even a bigger chance of a group going away. Everyone's seen that Telecom doesn't want to use too much energy. So uh, here we go again, attack, attack, attack. Hopefully some, someone will bring things back together. And we're at the back of the group here now and they're watching the leading group ride away from them. Our camera seems to be convinced that, that, that they've gone as he goes up towards the leaders here. Good split done primarily by the superb hard riding of Decker, who has just put himself on the front and kept himself going. And a question of anybody who can reach me can join me. Well, it was the Bonesta rider who made the junction. There he is. The other white jersey was Xavier Hon. But there is the counter-attack going off the front of Eric Decker. The Rabobank rider has put the hammer down completely, and he's decided he wants to make sure that this is the decisive part of this bike race. Well, he's having a superb tour so far, Eric Decker, and determined to stick at it here. As he races now, thinking of the third and final climb of the day, which is only 12 kilometres ahead of him. Well, I'm not too sure he'll survive this one, but he's taking a big gamble here, Decker, but he is a time trial champion of the Netherlands, and he's holding off the whole field. This breakaway pull of some 17 riders got away right at the start, and now Decker himself is not going to be caught. He has put the best part of a minute into the remnants of that breakaway, which has split up on the run into the finish. Well, he's ridden the Tour de France seven times, but he has never, ever won a stage, and he is absolutely delighted. Lighted. There'll be no change overall tonight because that was well controlled by the Telecom boys, but Decker doesn't care. This is a breakaway he is going to remember for the rest of his life as he now gets ready to give a two-armed salute here in villeneuve sur lot Not many bike rides get a chance to do this, Phil. A stage victory at the Tour de France, and it is a lot sweeter for this man because earlier this season in Paris-Nice he broke his elbow. Yes, and he's come back big time. I guess he softened his form up in the Giro d'Italia, and now it's come good in the Tour de France for Eric Decker. Great day out for him, by the way, because he's also taken the lead in the King of the Mountains competition. Here's the sprint now, which will be for fourth place, because Rodriguez is heading up the line here, and he gets into fourth place. And behind came Xavier Yon and Garcia Acosta. They got the major places. There's confirmation of that. And uh, there is the man in the new leader 
Porsche's jersey of the King of the Mountains. And again, once he stepped down off the podium, Paul Sherwin was waiting for him. What a fantastic win for you today, but to attack almost 30 kilometers from the finish must have been a pretty brave move. Yeah, it's incredible. It's uh, a dream come true. It's my uh, really first, first big win and I'm so happy. How was it riding down the final 500 meters there? You seem to be pretty much enjoying it. Yeah. <laughs> a few days ago, I was caught back on uh, 400 meters to go and I knew I, 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 I needed another chance to, had to prove that I can win a big race. And I suffered a lot uh, and this year. I broke my arm in Paris Nice and it's unbelievable. An emotional occasion, certainly, and why not? Eric Decker getting the biggest win of his career today. Overall, in the end, though, no change in the top five, and Alberto Eli keeps his lead for a third day, but Jens Voigt now appears in the top six in sixth place. Among those who fall back for the moment at least are Lance Armstrong to 16th, Jan Ulrich to 28th, David Miller down to 40th, and Marco Pantani down to 87th. Eric Decker's win, well, hasn't really helped his overall position. Another good day, though, for Alberto Eli, just a minor fright at the midway point when that lead was well in excess of his overall lead of the tour, but tonight he's still on top. Hello and welcome now to stage nine of the Tour de France. The riders pedalling their way to Dax in the southwest corner and then they'll be in the shadow of the Pyrenees. So far we've had six stage winners of the Tour, the road race legs, and they now know what it's like to join the elite band of riders who've won stages in the Tour and experienced that great emotion. Well, the joy of victory, but you know, Phil, this is the last day before the big mountain stages and all of these riders will be worried about that because for the first time, the big names of the Tour de France will have to come out and play tomorrow, but still, another day in the yellow jersey for Alberto Eli. And the race now heading towards the first sprint at Nerac, all together at 23 kilometers. Not much wind blowing again today and pleasantly warm at 24 degrees Celsius. Heading into the southwestern corner of France, just north of the Spanish frontier. And the field have made a very rapid start today and this should be one for Zabel if he's chasing points for that green jersey and I'm sure he is. Currently worn though by Marcel Wust and Marcel is going better and better. Wust over the line first and interestingly Jan Kersipu second there and Robbie McEwen of Australia getting third. Jan Ulrich looking very concentrated before the big mountains, Phil. He's at currently 28th overall, 6 minutes and 37 seconds down. But he has slimmed down a lot since we saw him racing in South Africa in the early part of the year. Also the big question mark over Marco Pantani, 87th in the standings, but he's certainly going to fly in the mountains. Well, he has improved from 136th, I suppose, which is what he was after the time trial. Moving on now to the second sprint of Paul Bosk. 68 kilometers in now and this time Zabel gets the points back Apollonio and Magnon no sign there of Wust in the points at least this is an interesting move at this point as well because the group had actually split but the big crash is happening once again and we can see several riders going down there and many of them all over the road well, that was a real shunt. It happened a ricochet effect right in the centre of the field there, Paul. And as so often happens on the stage of the Tour de France, it's on a long straight road and when the field are not racing. Well, that's the most dangerous time. Everyone relaxes just a little bit as we come up to the next and final sprint point of the day. And now Festina completely in control, trying to set up this sprint for their man Marcel Wust, who currently is looking very comfortable in the top of the leaderboard with the green jersey on his shoulders. 
Well, let's see now, because this is a real challenge coming from Marcel Wuster against uh, Eric Zabel. Two German riders fighting out the green jersey. It's almost unheard of in a Tour de France. Zabel is just back there with Fanini, keeping an eye on him too, as 132 kilometres is where we are now. An attack on the left there by Jackie Giron. Festina seem to be all over this race right now. Well, Jackie Duron stole in a march over the field here. He surprised everybody there. The response behind coming from Moro. He's the man from the Festina squad who is actually looking for a high place in the overall standings for, but I think a little despondent after a not very good performance in the opening time trial. He's onto the wheel of Duron and the sprinter started in earnest. Well, uh, Christophe Moreau is, gone, is going to get over the top of Jackie, but that uh, really spoilt the sprinters at their own game with that attack. And Moreau has done well to take the points away from the Lotto rider. And in third place, Mark Vouters keeps it in the camp of Rabobank. All of the field still together. On the run into the finish, though, this is the situation on the course. Four riders have managed to get just off the front of the main field. Paolo Bettini is in this group. Gert Verheyen is the rider from Lotto. Jose Vidal is the Kelme rider. And Didier Roos, the man from Bonjour. And Bonjour looking for a win here now. A French team uh, brought into the Tour de France and they really want to give themselves some credibility. There's Didier Roos on the far side and a little man from Mappe, I suspect he is the most experienced here. Paolo Bettini, winner this year of Liège Baston Liège. Well, their advantage inside the 30 second mark at the moment. All of the cars have been brought out and, in fact, less than that. 11 seconds as they are now inside the outskirts of Dax and the crowd is absolutely unbelievable. But Phil in the main field behind the is on and I think these guys just might get caught in the final straight well let's hope not because it looks like we're being treated here to a carbon copy of the situation the other day when Eric Decker and Jens Voigt were swept up with about 500 uh, 500 meters to go now they are wasting time here because they are so close to the finish Freddy Rodriguez is trying to hook up with Tom Steele he keeps looking for him in that blue jersey he may have him now and Didier Russo goes underneath the Spanish back flag there he starts the sprint for the line now but that field is coming so so quickly and Bettini is gambling but going off Bettini's wheel is Gert Verheyen in the red and Videl in the Kelme colours and Verheyen has started the sprint and the speed behind is Zabel on the left and steals as they come up to the line Bettini is going to get it right on the line but you know they're so close Paul they must get the same time well Zabel came out of nowhere there right onto the tail of that group and I think they will all be given the same time of per Perfectly timed sprint there by Paolo Bettini, getting himself across the line ahead of Verheya and Jose Angel Vidal, Zabel in fifth. Well, that's the result, and it was an excellent race, but they were all given at the same time. They crossed the line together, and what a result, though, for Paolo Bettini. Finally, a stage win in the Tour. This is his first Tour de France, by the way. And there is the race approaching the line. We can now go and speak with Gary Imlach. Nice job. You seem to come to the front there and slow everything down for Paolo. Yeah, I just got to the front, act like I was going to lead out to sprint. At the same time, I was just waiting for surges, and I just go in front of him and act like I was going to keep going, and, and they kept on falling for it. And there was a lot of corners, so I was able to take the front and maintain a slow speed. And then, I mean, we had confidence in Pop Bettini that he could pull it off, and he pulled it off, so it was perfect work. Today. Sneaky. It was sneaky, but it works. <laughs> Congratulations. Well, I'll tell you what, he is having a marvellous Tour de France and a great season. But Alberto Eli has brought the race now down to the first big mountains of this year's Tour, leading Fabrice Gugo by 12 seconds and Mark Wouters by a minute and 15 seconds. Well, he wanted to lead to the Pyrenees. He's done just that, but he'll have a fight on his hands now uh, because this is a real tough day. But no time to think about that just yet. He can collect his fourth leader's yellow jersey. And uh, I'm sure he feels pretty happy about that. The race is now set then to leave Dax and head for Lourdes Otakamp, a mountain high above the Pyrenees, it's 205 kilometres. The Pyrenees have awaited the Tour de France every summer since 1910 and today their angry mood promises a difficult day for most of the field. Heavy rain threatened on the Col d'Obisque, possible snowstorms near the high peaks and cold winds have been forecast. The Tour de France now is ready to reshape its leaderboard. 171 survived since Futuroscope 10 days ago and their departure from Dax at 10.45 local time heralded the toughest day so far 
with climbs of the Col de Marie Blanc, the Col d'Aubisque, the Col de Soulor, and the Finnish mountain of Hotakam, enough to frighten the most experienced. Overall, it's the Italian Alberto Elli, the surprise leader for four days, who heads Fabrice Gugo, Marc Wouters, and Pascal Chanter. But today, the favourites must come forth. Names like defending champion Lance Armstrong, Spain's Abraham Alano, former winner Jan Ulrich, and our own David Miller. Who knows what little Marco Pantani will try over his favourite terrain. Hello and welcome back to our coverage of the Tour de France. It's stage 10 today in the Pyrenees. We are at the top of Otakam and the weather here certainly far from hospitable. The riders themselves, they've left Dax and they're in heavy rain as well. Yet behind me you can see it hasn't deterred a large crowd coming here to Otakam. And the reason? This is without doubt the hardest approach we've ever made to the finish here. We're coming through the very heart of the Pyrenees to get up this climb. Well, Lance Armstrong, like all of the pre-race favourites, have remained somewhat anonymous this week in the Tour de France but he hasn't stopped Lance making a few notes and assessing his main rivals and indeed his own chances. But there's no doubt he's a serious contender. He's anybody with talent like that uh, and experience. He's won the Tour de France before. He's been second two times. He's, he's a young kid but he has a whole lot of experience so of course he's a favorite and his team is I think the last time I checked, they're the number one team in the world, so there's plenty of depth. Alex is, uh, is, is going to be a, a threat. He's going to be a factor in the race because I, I, he has the talent, he has experience. I raced with him in Dauphiné. I saw him. I know that he's strong. He has a strong team. He could win. He's clearly the best climber in the world, and, uh, and this tour is a lot harder and has a lot more mountains than it did last year. So it's uh, yeah, he's a threat. It's uh, can he put it all together for three weeks and climb consistently? I don't I don't know what he's been doing. I, I, I didn't he hasn't raced in a month, so Giro form is it? How does it uh, transfer to this? I don't know, but. Um, we have to keep an eye on him, and it's something that that the, there's not an individual time trial before the mountains, so he won't be at a deficit trying to make up time, make up time, make up time. He will, you know, technically he could have the yellow jersey going into the last time trial, and the time trials could be trying to make up time. You get into the Alps and climbs like the Madeleine, like Jouplan, um, Courchevel, Morzine, those are hard climbs. They're a lot harder than what we did last year. And, and the stages are, the stage to Briançon, 250 kilometers over, over the Isoar just before the finish. It's, it's a heavy, heavy course. And so, you know, we'll find out if, 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 uh, if I'm a balanced rider or if I can truly climb uh, in the high mountains. Well, Lance, and I think also we'll have to add, are you a great descender in the wet? Because the conditions today in the Pyrenees are certainly for the skillful. And on the Col de Marie Blanc, the weather conditions as bad as everywhere else in the Pyrenees today. Uh, but a breakaway early on, started by Jackie Duran, joined by Javier Ochoa and Nico Matan. They start the climb with 16 minutes and 20 seconds over the main field. But once on the climb, Duran was dropped. Ochoa went clear of Nico Matan. He went over the top of the climb with a 13-minute buffer over the peloton. While the peloton split up, a very select group of some 30 riders on the front, including all of the principal names, but dropped from that group the yellow jersey, who was more than a minute behind the principal players in the tour. Weather conditions, as always, in the mountains when it's bad, causing problems with our pictures, but nonetheless, the racing itself just going up a tempo, so surprisingly, Alberto Eli in a little bit of trouble. Once over the top, the two leaders regroup, uh, Javier Ochoa, Nico Matan, Jackie Duran over the top in third, but later fell and remounted, while the others came over the top at around about 13 minutes behind. So the field basically, amongst the favourites, still all together, are chasing two principal players, and now they're heading on to the slopes of the Col de Bisque. Well, we're looking here at the leader of the Tour de France today, not the overall leader, but the main attacker, Javier Ochoa, the Kelme team 
uh, Costa Blanca. He attacked very early on with Nico Matan. Again, Matan has been dropped on the climb of the Col d'Obisque and is riding in second place. But the field has been shattered here by tempo riding of the US Postal. But in, instead of riding away, they've shed themselves of all the team. And only Lance Armstrong is now in a very select group of about 22 riders. And ahead of Lance Armstrong and that select group are a number of riders still on the attack, including Richard Berenk, who has just gone clear. This is the leader of the Tour de France at the moment on the road as he's about three kilometres from the summit and it looks like in fact he's coming up to the summit here and he is of the Col d'Obisque and so he has a lead of some four kilometres over the principal bunch which contains Lance Armstrong and Jan Ulrich. But this group has got away from that bunch now and contains Richard Berenk and Fernando Escartin and Jimenez. So three very good riders in this group and they are riding ahead of the Ulrich Armstrong pack. Well, over the summit of the Col de Lobisque and these guys are not too far away from it right now. They don't really have the initial descent as you would do off most of the big climbs. They drop down onto a false flat which links the Col de Lobisque to the summit of the Col de Soulor and that's then when they will start the maneuver, the big maneuver of the descent on the way down. Richard Virenk, though, Phil can, can sense now that there are points available at the top of this climb here and he's moving forward to go over the line when we reach the summit and try and get himself as many points as possible because for him, one of his major goals apart from trying to win this bike race is also to take the King of the Mountains competition for a sixth time. These small bags that are being handed up by the uh, the race, the team helpers at the moment, they will in fact probably contain uh, warm drinks, warm tea that the riders they've prepared specially for this situation. Yes, in fact, there are still uh, some survivors. We forgot about little Camesso and uh, Mantebo and Bataro because they've gone over 10 minutes down, but the Varen group is almost on them now. So this is the important group in many people's eyes, containing Lance Armstrong and Jan Ulrich, uh, but they're still going over many minutes behind the first man on the road today, Ochoa, but they would prefer just to see the return to the group of riders like Escartine, I would think, and then they'd be happy because right now we've got Mansebo and Botero, and then we've got this group containing Jimenez and Heras, Escartin, etc. The teams will have posted people out on all of the mountain summits today, Phil, to help them out, because certainly we are riding in some incredible conditions, and it's very rare to see these kind of conditions at the Tour de France, and you have to put in a pretty good plan to make sure you keep all of your riders covered and still in the bike race. Well, Mario Ertz has gone over at 11 minutes, the back of the leader. The Varenk group's gone over 10 and a half minutes behind the leader. And we're waiting to see what time gap it is for Lance Armstrong's group. There they are. Just under 12 minutes is the gap from the group containing Lance Armstrong. So, as he goes on this rather false flat on the Col uh, d'Obisque, uh, Javier Ochoa still leads on the day in the Tour de France. Nika Matan looking a bit shaky, is second at four minutes. And then comes a small group now being joined by Richard Baronk. They are around at ten and a half minutes back. Armstrong's group a minute and a half back of them at approximately 12 minutes. And so there are big splits today in the Tour. And now the riders are on the start of the climb of Otakam and he's still away, this little man, Avia Ochoa, and he's now looking very good for the win. Looking down on the lovely town of Argeles, Gazos now, this is the group containing Jan Ulrich, Marco Pantani, Lance Armstrong. They are about a minute and ten seconds behind a group containing the danger men of Veronk and Escartin but way out up the road by about 10 minutes on this group is still that wonderful little Spanish rider, Javier Achua. He is now on the climb of Otacam to the finish and he is not looking like he's about to weaken. Well, just check out the position of Marco Pantani in this group. He's actually moved forward. He's got rid of the racing cape he was wearing before. He's got rid of the arm warmers. He's stripped down to the lightest he can possibly be, and certainly I would be expecting to see him when we get to the steeper gradient to launch an attack, because this, in the old days of Marco Pantani, certainly was his terrain. The mountaintop finish was an area where he was almost unbeatable. And he started the day such a long way behind overall. And he's still a lot of ground to make up in the Tour de France. 86 this morning, 
11 minutes off the race lead. He will fly up the classification on time tonight because a lot of the riders in front of him, of course, are now many minutes behind him, including the race leader, Alberto Eli. But the men he would like to be ahead of are right alongside him and losing no time. There he goes. And there he goes. It had to come. He is such a predictable man. Now, can he launch an attack that they can't answer? Well, Zulu is the man taking up the chase, and immediately after that is Lance Armstrong himself. Armstrong, wearing number one, was expecting the attack to come from Man pa Marco Pantani, as was everybody else in that group. Michael Boger now is trying to pick up the pace, and Zulu has gone straight over the top of Pantani. Pantani now must respond, but Armstrong is riding comfortably, Phil, there in third place. Here is Jan Ulrich, and Jan Ulrich, I think, has been caught here. Ulrich is trying to react, but I think we might be seeing Jan Ulrich in a bit of bother. Well, these guys are really climbing the, the, the climb field. They're accelerating away. You can see Ulrich is using a massive gear at the moment. This now looks like Peter Luttenberger, who's coming forward from the Onse squad, trying to pull his man, Abraham Alano, back into contention. But the thing is, the way those climbers went out of the, the gap there, it really was quite remarkable. And look at this, Armstrong accelerating once again, and there's a gap now starting to appear between Lance Armstrong and Marco Pantani getting out of the saddle, going back into the saddle, trying to find uh -oh. a little bit more strength and he's popped well i never thought i'd see the day when lance armstrong would blow away the man we've always referred to as the finest climber we've ever seen in the current peloton of cycling but he started it and armstrong has finished it and now lance armstrong has written off the riders on the climb of otakama shaken the head there by little marco pantani now Armstrong has got his chance here to end this terrible day in the Pyrenees right up there having taken time of all of the principal players he could well ride up to that group now containing Escartine tremendous turn of speed and strength as he now tries to cut down the gap to this rider here who looks to be getting a little bit tired at last and if anybody's entitled to be tired it's this man but I think he's done enough now to hang on to his lead well, this gap is actually coming down pretty rapidly. 5.56 and 7 minutes 34 to Lance Armstrong. Armstrong has taken a minute out on the climbers on the climb, the first part of this ascent, and he's closing in on them all the time. He's actually, at the moment, just going by Nico Matin, another one of the great heroes of the day. Oh. Nico Matin was in that early breakaway of three riders and he has still survived. Which means that Armstrong is coming up at the back of the Escartine group here. Nico Matin has been a survivor today, hasn't he? What a hero. He even tried to kick in there and ride back to the group and I think he's about to do it. He has had a wonderful ride today and he's not going to get the position to show for it. But Armstrong moves on now, relentlessly cutting his way through the Tour de France today that's been shattered all over the Pyrenees. We're letting them all run like a great fisherman and then reeling them in one after another. Now he comes up behind Fernando, uh, Federico, uh, Fernando Escartin. Yes, sir. Keep getting his name right. Fernando Escartin and also Richard Veron. There are now nobody, there is nobody in front now who Lance Armstrong will fear in this year's tour. Here's good news for our man out front. He's going through now with five kilometers to go for Javier Ochoa. But boy, he's getting tired. I hope he hangs in there. Well, this is the group of Jan Ulrich with Marco Pantani. Alex Zuller is the next man a little further up the road there. Zuller now all on his own, setting the tempo. Escartin and Heras are hanging on as Armstrong kicks again. And this time, I don't think they'll answer him. This is unbelievable. He's got serious power going on here, Lance Armstrong. He's not actually attacked them now, Phil. He's just putting the hammer down, looking over his shoulder to see what sort of difficulty he's putting them into. He's controlled and he's absolutely decided on doing the job in hand. He's a very concerned rider right now because he wants to try and blow the climbers away and give himself even more of an advantage before we go up to the Mont Ventoux, a climb that he himself is always scared of. This is the man that was regarded as the king of the mountains, the fastest man on all of the ascents, and today, Phil, he's been put into serious difficulty. He showed flashes of his former glory in the Tour of Italy recently this year, but he hasn't got it here on the slopes of Otakam, and neither has Jan Ulrich. No, you can't take time out in big chunks like Ulrich and Pantani have done over the past year and expect to come back and win a race like the Tour de France because that's also Paulo Nico Matan coming by. Another beaten man here in Al Al Alex Zula. I've never seen so many tired big names in the Tour de France for years. These fellows have all tried and have been destroyed. Armstrong let them all do it and then has ridden them off.
Well, this is now Alex Zuller just trying to keep as much of a, his advantage as possible over the others, but he's really just surviving here on the slopes of Otakam. He's just ridden himself up to the back wheel of Christophe Moreau, who really is riding a fantastic bike race because he's not one of the names we would have given at the start of the day of a man who would be up with a chance of riding high in the overall standings at the Tour and riding high in the mountains either. Well, this is uh, Jimenez here. Looks a little bit like it, Miguel Indurain as he comes up behind Lance Armstrong. Armstrong pedals that low gear as he always does. Has a good look at the board there and works out whether he can catch this man, I think. Because this rider now will be at three kilometers from the summit. The end of a long day and uh, I think he now knows that. Oh, it hurts. He's really going slow. I think he has hit the wall there, Phil. I think he because has. Because he's having a real hard time digging those pedals over the top. He has obviously suffered today 175 miles, kilometers at the front of the bike race, and a lot of it in weather conditions like this. Armstrong now, 4 oh. minutes, 25 seconds. It could all go down to the very last kilometer, because Armstrong and Jimenez here are flying up this mountain. What an amazing Tour de France. Yesterday on a flat road, the four leaders were given the same time as the finishing bunch behind. Behind them. Then we had Jens Voigt and Eric Decker passed 400 metres from the line the other day. And now, Paul, it could all happen again here to Ochoa. Well, there's Marco Pantani in the pink of the Mercatoni Uno squad. In front of him on the road is Michael Bogard, and just a little way in front of him is Jan Ulrich. But Armstrong here is showing that he is a climber. He'd actually said, just wait until we get to the mountains if you think I can't climb hills. And he's certainly proving today that he is, and now uh, one of the greatest climbers in the sport because he's lost a lot of weight because of that illness of his, where, which nearly took his life, but he has managed to retain almost all of his strength. Well, the great Eddie Merckx is uh, commentating for Belgian television here today. He's just come on to the race for day one for him. This is the way he used to win his races. He just destroyed the opposition one-on-one. -on -one. And he won the Tour de France five times. And there'll be very few people now that won't tell you that Lance Armstrong's going to win it for the second time. Today, for sure, he'll pull on the leader's yellow jersey. As we come to the one kilometre to go for the man who has been the outright hero of the day, although that now is highly debatable. I think he just might do it. He's got 1,000 metres to go once he goes under that bridge, the red kite, the flam rouge in international cycling. Every bike rider will be looking for it, but they look for it more than on any other stage in the mountains because they know then that relief is only just around the corner. But Armstrong is around about 600 metres behind this guy at the moment, and a big sprint to the line could change it completely. It is Ochoa, Armstrong. The difference in the speed is remarkable. Well, uh, Armstrong is just trying to finish this off with a sprint finish here, and that might be what exactly it will be. We're 900 metres from the finish with the race leader, and Armstrong is racing up towards the 1,000 metres to go. Where he's found this strength from, I don't know. He has torn the field apart here. The crowd here cheering him on, but no, not with quite the same enthusiasm because they want that Spanish rider to win. They want him to win, they want him to get over the line in first position. A lot of Basque flags out here as well, Phil. We're only just over the border from Spain and they've all turned out in their numbers to see him. There's the American flag for Armstrong, 1 minute and 39 seconds. He's ripping into that advantage that Ochoa has. I don't think he's going to do it by the line, but it's going to be very, very close. They should be in the same straight. They will be. There is the kilometre across the road now in the climb of Otakam. Lance Armstrong has taken nine nine whole minutes off the leader and it'll be probably nine and a half minutes by the line here he is now living in a world of his own and suffering like he never has in his life and will the top of Otakam please come as soon as possible? Well, if he looks across to the right-hand side, he'll see all the television trucks waiting for him there, but he hasn't even got to the 500 metres to go banner yet. So Armstrong is just 500 metres behind him, and a long way down the slopes are Ulrich, Zulla and Marco Pantani. They are losing big time on the first big mountain stage of this year's tour. He's now scoring over everybody here, and this rider has done the ride of his life. He's never won a pro race in his career. What a way to start after a brilliant escape of 175 kilometers. Well, it was one minute and 23 seconds under the final kilometer there for Lance Armstrong. If, in fact, Ochoa looks back down the, lane, the straight there, he will be able to see Armstrong boring.
pouring down upon him very shortly 114 it's gone down oh. even more this man has got to find a bit more strength but I think Phil he has done it he has survived he had 17 minutes at one stage he had 10 minutes at the bottom of this climb it doesn't really matter how much is left now because I think he's going to get the win Never has the voice of Daniel Manjas, the speaker of the Tour de France, sounded so good because he knows now he's coming up to the line. This has been a superb ride. He could never have thought when he broke away and joined Jackie Giron on the flat roads outside Dax that it would lead to victory at the finishing line at Otakam. And at 175 kilometers later, he is turning into the home straight while Lance Armstrong of the United States is continuing to close in at an alarming rate. Well, he's done it, Phil. He's now inside the barriers. He's now inside the signs that are ticking off the meters to go. Just 200 meters to go for him now, and the straight will be in sight. As he comes up the barriers now, the headlights are on, but miraculously the crowd has lifted. He gets the victory, Javier Ochoa, and this is a superb victory today in the Tour de France. Six hours plus in the saddle, but watch the back of your screen there, because here he comes. Lance Armstrong, as the clock ticks down, is racing to the yellow jersey of the Tour de France. He was the first man last year to wear it and became the second and only man after that. Today he'll be the fourth man. Is he the last one in this year's tour? Time will tell. But Armstrong today has destroyed the field in the Tour de France. The minutes are ticking off once he hits the line. A determined and ultimate impression of Lance Armstrong today as he comes up to the line. And look at that time gap. 10 minutes 35 at the bottom, 41 seconds at the top. Jose Maria Jimenez, a former teammate of Miguel Indurain. He came here as the teammate of Alex Zuller, but I think by tonight he will be the leader of Bonesta. So he has conceded one minute and 12 seconds. Great ride by Kelme Phil, but Risa Varenka has also put in a pretty fine performance here as well. He's come past Beltran over the top here. He's not going to get the king of the mountains today. That will certainly go to the man who took the stage. But fourth over the line, Risa Varenka just ahead of Beltran. So here's a look now at the damage which was done today. Fernando Escartin finishing sixth, Roberto Heras seventh, and Christoph Morrow in eighth place. Alex Zuller lost three minutes, 47 seconds. Jan Ulrich, unlucky 13th, lost over four minutes. Michael Bogert, over five. And Marco Pantani, who started the attacking, he trailed in almost six minutes back. Of others, Abraham Olana was 23rd, but indeed a good ride by David Miller. He should be pleased with his finish of 36th. A first podium finish tonight for Javier Ochoa, and what a ride he did today. But overall, it's all changed as Lance Armstrong claims the yellow jersey now, and look at the time gaps. Jan Ulrich is second, but over four minutes back. Ochoa is in the frame now in eighth. Of the other big names, many of them are down. 11th now for Richard Berenk, 12th for Abraham Alano, 13th for Alex Zulla, but the big time gaps are there. And Marco Pantani, well, he's a long way back too, but he has come up from 84th overall. In yellow tonight, Lance Armstrong, a real day of giant killing for him, and when he came down from the podium, he spoke to Paul Sherwin. But when the selection actually came, it wasn't really you that started it, it was Marco Pantani and Zulla, and you finished it off. Pantani attacked and then um, and Zula went, you know, came through, pulled pulled through on him like uh, like he was effortless. And so we were, we, me and Pantani both said, "Whoa, this, this could be a long race," because he was flying. And then uh, and then he and then he was dropped. So and then I was with Marco for a while. I expected him to pull through, but uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe he has uh, it's been out of racing a little bit long, but he'll be a factor in the Alps. You want to win the stage today obviously but uh, what about a word for the guy who hung on to win yeah I had no I had no desire to win the stage no uh, my, my ambition was to, to put time on my rivals and and uh, you know if that meant getting 10th that was okay you know and the kid who won I mean who did chapeau I mean it was away all day and, and, and it was obviously strong it's a hard climb and to stay away you have to be uh, a strong man a lot of Spanish people on the climb I think they uh, they encouraged him some. And just to complete the picture, Eric Zabel in the green jersey tonight bringing home the autobus and in this group of the former yellow jersey of the tour, Alberto Eli. They finished almost 32 minutes back but inside the time limit so they get to race again tomorrow.
And sadly, nine riders out of the tour today, including Credit Agricole's Jonathan Vortis from the USA, who has crashed and believed to have broken his nose. That's the second year in a row for Jonathan Vortis. Really bad luck. The race goes on and it continues now with stage 11 from Banyer to Ravel. And we're in an area now that just simply loves the Tour de France as it courses its way past, of course, the famous sunflower fields which are bound down here, the tournesols, which mean they always turn towards the sun. Gali Imlach is among them. The man Lance Armstrong defers to as the best climber in the world lost over five minutes to him yesterday on the Tour's first mountain stage. But then considering the amount of time Marco Pantani's lost over the last year, maybe it's less remarkable that he's behind in the race than that he's in the race at all. E io per vincere non ho bisogno del doping, ma ho bisogno delle salite. Oh, he's done it again! He's done it again! Two years ago, Marco Pantani was at the height of a career built on it. He'd exploded the modern myth that climbers can't win the major tours by winning two. First the Giro d'Italia, then the Tour de France. A clear winner. Then, last year, on the brink of repeating his Giro win, he failed a blood test and began a descent which threatened to develop into terminal decline. As Pantani's medical records became evidence in various investigations into doping in Italian sport, a series of dates for his return to racing came and went. L'obiettivo è quello di essere ci al 100% e puntare a vincere. That was Pantani sounding optimistic about his chances for the World Championships last October. But 11 months on from the Giro blood test, his public appearance total read three ongoing court cases and two days competitive racing. The speculation shifted from when he'd return to weather. Quando tornerà a correre, se lo può dire? Ma non lo so, e quando, quando il, mio, il mio stato d'animo sarà ottimale. Questione di giorni, di settimane o di mesi? Ma non, non faccio promesse. Finally, in a classic piece of Italian melodrama, he appeared before the Pope at the pre-race celebrations for this year's Giro and confirmed he'd be resuming his career where he'd left off. Credo che sia una prova difficile perché per uno abituato a fare la corsa rimanere di dietro sicuramente soffrirò sotto il profilo psicologico. On the Giro's first mountain stage Pantani lost nearly seven minutes. But ten days later he was riding at the front over the Col de Isoire, helping his teammate Stefano Garzelli, then helping himself to second place in Briançon. When Garzelli won the race overall, he dedicated his victory to Pantani. So, on the evidence of the Giro, perhaps we should all hold off a bit on the Pantani obituaries. He lost less time to Lance Armstrong in the Tour's first mountain stage than he did to Francesco Casagrande on the corresponding day in Italy. And coincidentally, the terrain he relaunched himself on in the Giro over the Isoard to Briançon is coming up on this race in four days' time. Well, Pantani still playing a waiting game as we now are just 12 kilometres from the finish here. The red number on the back of Eric Decker, which means he's the most aggressive rider so far. Nobody can doubt that. And with him today on the attack, Santiago Botero. And when they get to the finish, Decker beats Botero after a break, Paul, of 204 kilometres. Absolutely remarkable. A great ride there by that man, Eric Decker. A back seat in the mountains and in this group coming to the line now is David Miller there in second position, the man who wore the first yellow jersey in this Tour de France. He's not going to get third place across the line though, Phil. That's going to go to Rick Brugger of Lotto, but a great challenge there coming from David Miller. And Miller trying desperately to get the best of this little group here, but it is Verbrugge who comes up on the right, and Eric Zabel behind is leading out the sprint here for best of the rest. Well, Eric Zabel on the right-hand side, Phil, now wearing the green jersey, but Armstrong is still the leader after 11 stages, 4 minutes and 14 seconds ahead of Jan Ulrich. Christoph Moreau is third, 5, 10 behind. We have had a remarkable first attempt into the mountains, but look at the gaps already. Abraham Alano, 7 minutes behind. Marco Pantani, 24, 10 minutes, 34 back. But the king of the mountains is Javier Ochoa. Leads his own teammate there, Santiago Botero. This man now looking seriously good as the challenger for the green jersey for the points competition ahead of Marcel Wust and Tom Steele's the early leaders. 
Francisco Mancebo leads the Young Rider competition, but for every bike rider in the Tour now, it's the Géant de Provence as the race leaves Carpentros to the Mont Ventoux. Hello again and welcome to the top of Mont Ventoux. This is the Giant of Provence and the riders setting off this morning. They can see this mountain all day and they know they must finish up here. Well, the only good thing we can say is the snow has stopped because although it's sunny, it is very, very cold with the wind chill factor probably no more than five degrees Celsius and the wind is gusting at up to 60 miles an hour. The rides will know today they really have a battle on their hands. This is the overall situation. At the top is Lance Armstrong, the defending champion, 4.14 ahead of Jan Ulrich, Christoph Moreau, Mark Wouters still right there. Peter Lutenberger looks as though he's returning to form at last, now riding for Onse is fifth. Of the other big names, Alano 13th and we've hardly seen him, Alex Zola the same must be said. Fernando Escartin, he's a climber, today he's going to have to come out. Marco Pantani now up to 24th, Paul, this is the start of the climb and there's some familiar faces and there are others missing including Alex Zola in trouble. Well, Alex Zola does not look good at all. He is in serious difficulty at the back of the group. With him, it is Leonardo Pipoli, another man suffering the big climber from Spain, Fernando Escartin, and all of this because of the pressure on the front of the pack from two riders from US Postal, Tyler Hamilton and Kevin Livingston. Well, in fact, Tyler Hamilton has gone backwards as we speak. And there's a number of riders gone out of the race, including Tom Steeles and Marcel Wust and also Cham McRae. So three interesting names are out. Marco Pantani looks to be in a little bit of trouble here now as Lance Armstrong with just one teammate left with him and Jan Urek always watching. The other interesting rider here again, Paul, is Yoshiba Balocki. Well, the young rider from Festina there in fourth position in the blue jersey is a major revelation of this year's cycling season. In this group as well is Richard Virog and riding across the gap there Roberto Heras. Marco Pantani Phil, well I don't think he's back on complete form right now because he's getting dropped off the back of the group as is Laurent Jalabert who wears number 51 for France. Well, the climb this year starts at Bedouin and on the rest day of the Tour de France they, they had a tourist routier that was a touring cycle ride up the mountain here the wind was so strong the police actually closed the mountain happily although the wind is still very strong it has eased uh, just that little bit but as we continue on the climb here now with Kevin Livingstone doing all of the work to try and give Lance Armstrong a great sight of the climb when we get up towards Shelley Reynard Zula has lost almost a minute now to Armstrong's group, Belocki is hanging on Richard Varenk looks cool, there's Heras come back a little bit and also in this group too we've got uh, Alexander Vinokurov and that's a little bit of a surprise although he is a reasonable climber well, he was in that earlier breakaway, one of the last survivors. This man, too, is the man that France hopes will ride high in the overall standings, Christophe Moreau. He's actually a little further down the slopes at the moment with a couple of his teammates. One of them, the very good climber there, Felix Garcia Casas. But Marco Pantani, Phil, he's been dropped about three times so far, and he keeps pulling himself back up to this group of Lance Armstrong. He doesn't seem quite able to answer to the change in pace. And the same can be said of Laurent Jalabert, because he has just rejoined that group group more or less uh, he's been dropping back as well since we left Bedouin well the different difficult thing about this climb of the Mont Ventoux is because of all the day dif different changes in the gradient it gets very steep in parts and then it levels off and it's on the the steeper parts I think Marco Pantani is coming back sorry for the picture breakup but it is very difficult up here on the slopes of the Mont Ventoux as we now see the work here being done by Kevin Livingston slowly but surely pulling all of these riders back into the fold that Kelme rider there is Santiago Bot he was in a leading group fill of nine riders who got away on the first climb of the day. Well, he's turning out to be an amazing cyclist, is Santiago Botero. We've seen him already finish second after that massive breakaway of more than 200 kilometers. And clearly, he's not too tired yet. These are still the lower slopes of Mont Ventoux as we head up towards Chalet Renard and then we turn very sharp left and out onto the bottom slopes of this mountain. Again, Kevin Livingstone doing a terrific job here, super domestique, setting the pace for Armstrong, a pace which indeed is hurting some illustrious names today on the Tour de France. One man missing, Abraham Alano, nowhere to be seen on the slopes of the Mont Ventoux here at the moment, but what a great job being done there by that man on the front, Kevin Livingstone. A little further down the slopes, the man who leads the King of the Mountains competition after that very long breakaway up to Otakam, Javier Ochoa. He too, Phil, is in difficulty on the slopes of this massive mountain. 
and he did that brilliant ride in the Pyrenees where he just hung on to win the stage there ahead of Lance Armstrong. Well, there was, a, there was a breakaway today of nine, which led for much of the way till we got to the slopes of this climb. An attack here now by Heras, and a response immediately by Lance Armstrong, who now looks as though he's going to have to be left to do it himself. But the way Heras, when he saw Armstrong counter the move, he sat up. He knew exactly what was coming next. He decided, well, Armstrong's not going to let me ride off the front, so I might as well wait for him. Richard Viron has responded there in third position, and so has Jan Ulrich riding himself back up to this group. Santiago Bate there Phil is still in the group but you know Marco Pantani has disappeared once again so has Kevin Livingston after a great job done by him for the team he will now just have to survive on the slopes of this great mountain Armstrong is cadence the talking point of the Tour de France he pedals twice as quickly as anybody else again it looks as though Laurent Jalabert is in a bit of bother he's coming off the back of the group after those accelerations we are not far away now from Chalet Reynard but you see the long sweeping climb as he goes up towards the observatory well, the and weather, this is it, this is Chalet Reynard the weather looks fantastic but I tell you one thing it is not hot up here and very often we've come up this mountain in the past Phil and it's been over 100 degrees Fahrenheit today it is actually very cold and after seeing the summit of this climb yesterday I really cannot believe that the bike riders are coming up here today bathed in sunshine well what an incredible audience a grandstand high on this mountain of Mont Ventoux awaiting the arrival of the leaders of the tour and the Mayo Jean of Armstrong is right there in the number one position and I must say Paul that the man who has yo-yoed off the back again but he's still chasing is Pantani well Pantani and Laurent Jalabert those two riders I think deciding today to ride at their own rhythm not to lose too much time at all just to try and keep themselves in contact and for Marco Pantani despite the fact he's not stayed in this yellow group of Lance Armstrong he in fact is, in, is moving up in the overall standings but in fact Phil once again the Pirate is coming back to the leading group on the road the last time check we were given was six seconds but it certainly isn't that right now he's <laughs> onto the tail of Armstrong it's amazing this man has dangled off the back by as much as 12 to 15 seconds and now on the steepest part of the climb he has pedaled smooth as you like onto the back of this group and he's now hooked up with uh, Roberto Heras, Lance Armstrong and this again a very very worthwhile breakaway the tempo on the front being set by the man who has five times won the King of the Mountains competition at the Tour de France, Richard Vironc. He is a man from this area of France and he certainly would like to do something special on the slopes of this mountain because the men who have won here in the past, Phil, have all been cycling legends. They are names that we write stories about. Merix has won up here, Charlie Gaul has won up here, Tevenet, Poulidor, and a man who wins today, everybody will remember him. They most certainly will and the majority of the winners up here are on the race too to watch how the modern time climbers tackle the slopes of Vontu. Richard Veronk is a proud mountain climber, he's finding a little bit of resistance this year though in his search to wear the polka dot jersey, still on the shoulders of Javier Ochoa but not by the end of this day because he's lost ground a bit today. Renk takes uh, gratefully a drink there off the spectators. Baloki is on the left, but now an attack by Marco Pantani. I think Haras has tried to jump on his tail, but this is a very determined and unexpected move. Unbelievable. This man has been dropped about six times so far on the slopes of the Mont Ventoux, and every time he's fought his way back. This is an attack with just sheer courage, Phil. I don't think he has the legs to go off the front of the group. He just wants to show everybody in the world the pirate is back. This man was regarded as the best climber in the world. That attack does not come to anything much at all here because the whole of the group has come back together once again. And the man who recovered first was Yoshiba Baloki. This incredible surprise is having a great season. But another attack immediately as he got them sense on his back wheel. This time Harass isn't going to follow as now Pantani realises he's got them on the defensive. He kicks again. Well, Harass is taking up the chase once more. Now the chase behind him is going to come from Jan Ulrich. Ulrich today, Phil, is in the great shape. He, in fact, is right himself back into the Tour de France he's a long way down on Lance Armstrong in the overall standings right now but we still have an awful long way to go the pirate has flown but this is not the pirate of old you know he hasn't opened up the gap immediately and these bike riders are able now to respond to his attacks 
and just now they don't need to respond because Pantani is 24th overall and is still a lot of ground to make up. Armstrong riding a very canny race here as he did on the climb of Otakam. He let the other riders attack first. Now is he planning to finish it off himself as this group once again has lassoed the pirate and brought him back? Well the reason they won't let him go Phil is obviously he is a long way down in the overall standings but everybody wants to win this stage. This is the stage of the Mont Ventoux, the Géant de Provence, the biggest mountain with one of the biggest reputations in the sport of international cycling Marco Pantani Phil he's gone again he keeps hitting them and one moment or another they're going to let him go well he's looking for ten and a half minutes he won't get that in one mountain climb of course but a minute or so's gain right now will make this man a real threat in this year's Tour de France especially with the very difficult days still to come in the Alps well, he must be super motivated by the presence of Charlie Gaulle here at the Tour de France. Charlie Gaulle, the Luxembourger, known as the Angel of the Mountains, was the first man to win here on the summit of the Mont Ventoux, and that was an awful long time ago. But these two have hit it off together. They appreciate each other's riding styles, and Marco Pantani may well be trying to do something very special here today. And if he can win, well, it will be a remarkable performance for a man out of competition for a whole 11 months. I couldn't agree more, and the message coming in from Johan Brunier there to Lance Armstrong, who's having a word in his little radio as we look at Santiago Batero here, trying to get on turns with Pantani, and Batero, for me, is one of the finds of this year's event. What a great bike rider, strange background as well, as Armstrong now accelerates, goes on the right-hand side of the road, they all look the other way, nobody could respond to that attack, he caught them napping, you know, it's as if he's being radio controlled by his team manager, Johan Brunier, the other guys here were were absolutely on the rivet and although Jan Ulrich looked pretty good he cannot lift the pace well that was an incredible attack and you're right Ulrich was flat out he's gone straight past Botero as if he's not moving at all and he's now pedaling up to Marco Pantani and there's no doubt he's going to catch him at the way he's riding here Armstrong chose his moment and just flew away from the field with no show of resistance at all from Ulrich well the amazing thing is Phil look at his pedaling style there he is so much lower than anybody else on the slopes of this climb even Marco Pantani who is a magnificent climber Armstrong is pedaling around about 15 to 20 revolutions per minute much faster than he is he's now almost on the tail of the pirate and I wonder will he go straight past to try and storm his, his, his dominance on this Tour de France he really is turning himself into being one of the best climbers in the world well, the view up here at two and a half kilometres to go is sensational from Mont Ventoux. You can see for a hundred miles around, he goes past the pirate. He almost invites the pirate to come and join him on the back wheel. He's looking to see the damage he's doing. I think the man he wants to hurt most is Jan Ulrich just now. And he's got himself the gap here. He let Ulrich set the pace. Now the gap has opened again as Lance just keeps this interminable rhythm here. Once more, the pirate, for the, not the first time on Mont Ventoux, is now on the defensive. Well, I think he snapped him as well. He just accelerated. This was not an attack by Lance Armstrong, just a mere acceleration. But a mere acceleration when your name is Lance Armstrong from Austin, Texas, is going to hurt anybody's legs. The pirate, though, Phil, is fighting his way back. Today, he is digging really deep into the suitcase of courage. Well, do you think Lance was riding a mountain bike with the gear he's pedalling up this hill here and so quickly as well? Pantani noticeably slower but has ridden back up to the back wheel of Armstrong who hasn't got back in that saddle, I don't think, since he broke away. He is just riding a rhythm. Remember that Lance has seen all of the mountains in this year's Tour de France one way and another because he takes his preparation very seriously. Including this one. He had a bad time on this one in the Dauphiné Libéré when he was blown away by his own teammate, his teammate Tyler Hamilton, who went on to win the Dauphiné Libéré. Armstrong came to this bike race. This mountain was a big fear for him, but he has trained it three times, Phil, since the Dauphiné Libéré, and he is looking now very much at ease. He's waiting for some kind of attack now to come from Marco Pantani but for Armstrong certainly he has to win here this is one of the monuments of cycling well because of the high winds there is no banner across the road no finish line structure at all it won't be that evident to the riders as they come up towards the summit you see the flags you can see how strong the wind is blowing and the gaps are opening now on Ulrich and Co 
Well, the Pirate happy there to stay on the wheel of Armstrong. Armstrong looking over his shoulder. Every time they come round a corner, they're expecting the finish to be there. This time it should be as they take it wide now. The finish is only metres away here. We're a bit obstructed by the motorbike, but Armstrong is on the left and Pantani is on the right. And they're coming up to the line now. And it's almost as if Armstrong is not making a big effort here. And Pantani is determined and Pantani crosses the line. It almost looks as though Lance Armstrong was not interested in winning the stage. Well, look at this. The next man to come up is going to be Yosiba Belocchi. The big revelation here from Festina. He's with Jan Ulrich, Ulrich struggling up the last incline of this big mountain, Phil. Well, this has been an outstanding ride by Yoshiba Belocchi. He's no longer a shock in the tour now. He's going to climb up into the top three or four riders. He is over, taking time out of Jan Ulrich, who comes over in fourth place. 29 seconds. There's the result of the climb then. Pantani, same time as Armstrong. Botero did very well to come home in fifth. And Roberto Heras getting there in sixth place, 48 seconds down. But you know, that was an incredible ride by Pantani and a sensational ride by Lance Armstrong. And the overall now, oh no, we're looking further down here, the stage result. Christophe Moreau got 10th. Laurent Jalabert did a very good ride in the end to hang on for 12th place, but he lost two minutes. So the Pirate is back. He wasn't going to ride the Tour of Italy, and he made a last minute decision when he finished the Tour of Italy. He said he would go for the Tour de France, and he keeps on climbing up the overall classification. Armstrong leading, increased lead for him now to 4 minutes 55 over Ulrich. Belocchi is third, Christophe Moreau is fourth, and Beltran is up to fifth. And as you look further down the list, Pantani is now up to 12th place overall in the Tour. Zola is 13th. But here's the man of the moment, and here he is now with Gary Imlach. Another masterly day in the mountains, Lance. Did, did you feel as strong as you looked out there today? Um, Montu is not a good climb for me. I, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know if uh, we're, we're necessarily good friends. So I was glad to get it over with. And it's difficult when you have uh, an advantage of three or four minutes because you don't need to attack. So mentally, you're not as aggressive as uh, as you should be. But in the end, it was a good result. I was worried about the Vontu. Certainly, approaching the line, you looked like you had bigger things on your mind than the stage win. Yeah, it's that's true. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's nice to win, but it's not important uh, to win every stage or to win stages. It's important to win the overall in Paris. Lance may not like the climb of Mont Ventoux, but it certainly proved kind to him today. On the podium tonight, he gets a third yellow jersey. Tomorrow we're on flatter and one hopes less windy roads to Draguignan. It'll be stage 13 of the Tour de France as the nation here celebrates Bastille Day.